good to see everyone out this morning. It's a little frigid out there, but uh, it's good to be inside where it's warm to uh, worship God. Uh, it's time to begin our services. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know you're our most honored guest, and we hope to see you again. Please take a moment to fill out a visitor's card that's in the pew in front of you and drop that in the collection tray or leave it on the pew and we'll pick it up at the appropriate time. Uh, please silence any cell phones or noise-making devices that may distract from our services. Let there be light. So, okay. That makes it a lot easier to read. Uh, as far as uh, sick and in the hospital, we've got a number uh, here to uh, go through, but see our bulletin for a list of others that are shut in and those that are undergoing health issues as well. Uh, there are many who need our prayers. Uh, Beth McCullum is home this morning, uh, sick with the flu. Madeline McNabb needs our prayers for health issues. Gina Barrow's mother, Susan Lake, needs prayers as she deals with lung disease and cancer treatments. Rosetta Meacham is home recovering from hip replacement. Maggie Palladini has been uh, released from the hospital. She had breathing problems, uh, scared a lot of us, but she is home recovering. Uh, Betty Padilla, son-in-law, and daughter need prayers for health issues. And if you don't know this morning, Ms. Frieda Lewis is in intermediate care at Memorial Hospital. Uh, Jim said she did have a stroke, so we need to make sure we pray for her. Uh, as far as general announcements, we're having a special fellowship next Sunday evening after uh, services to honor Roger and Donna's uh, work with us here. And everyone is invited. Order of services this morning, Eddie Howe will have our opening prayer. Josh Gilbright will have our closing. And for scripture reading, Micah Perry and Alex Clark. Uh, and Brother Bob, lead us in some. Oh, sorry. Les is going to be filling in for Alex. Brother Bob will lead us in song. Good morning, everyone. Let's start with number 403. Number 403. <clears throat> In the desert of sorrow and sin.
Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to come here today and to worship you, Father, in song and in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you for the, our brothers and sisters that have come this morning to, to hear your word and to worship you, Father. We thank you for creating the this earth, Father, that we live on and, and life here on earth, Father, is so short, but, but it is so sweet. And, and we thank you for, for sending your only begotten Son to this earth, Father, to die for our sins, to give us a chance, Father, at everlasting life. We look, Father, we look forward to being at our home in heaven, Father, with you. And thank you, Father, for, for our congregation here and, and all your many blessings. Father, we want to pray for our sick. Father, we'd like to pray for Frida Lewis. Father, just be with her. And, in this time, Father, and give her strength, Father, and help her through this. Father, we pray for Marilyn McNam, Father, and Beth McCollum. Father, I can't remember them all. There's so many. Father, you know who they are. Father, bring them back to good health and so they can rejoin us here at, at Greens Lake Road. Father, we pray for, for the Ukraine and that you can get that evil menace out of Ukraine, Father, and those people can, can go back and, and build their homes and enjoy their country once again. Father, we're thankful to, to be here today, Father, and we can worship you in, in song, Father, and in and we can study your scriptures and, and we can listen to the lessons that are going to be brought to us this morning, Father. Father, we can take these lessons to heart and we can pass these, what we learn on to our neighbors and our friends and our family. Father, we, we praise you and, and we're on our way to heaven, Father. We hope that we can do what is right here on this earth and, and we can follow, follow your guidance and do as you would have us to do. Father, be with us now as, as we continue our worship service. Help us, Father, to, to sing out from the heart. Father, we love you with all our heart. Help us to Listen to the lessons, Lord. Take them to heart. Be with us now, Father. And guide us, guard us, and direct us. And, and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Sing number 393, verses 2 and 3. 393, verses 2 and 3. May we keep in memory all that thou hast said. May we truly worship as we eat the bread.
scripture reading will be from the book of Mark. The book of Mark, chapter 15, starting with verse 22. Mark 15, 22. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. With him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day on the many blessings you give us. Thankful for this opportunity to take this bread that represents Christ's body that was given on the cross. Heavenly Father, as we partake of it, may we focus our thoughts on what it symbolizes the suffering and sacrifice that was made for remission of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we also, as we think about the cross, about the blood that was shed for our sins, we're thankful for Jesus' willingness to do this according to thy blessings and promises also for us. Be with us as we partake of it, and that we can do so in a manner to be pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. Matthew 25, 34. Then the king shall say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Heavenly Father, as we take this opportunity to give back a portion of which we have prospered, we pray these funds be used to do thy will, spread thy word. Heavenly Father, we pray that we give with a happy, cheerful heart. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Mark 577, that will be our song of exhortation. 577. And before the lesson, number 525. 525. I'm turning my Bible this morning to the book of James, chapter 1. Hope you'll join me there. James, chapter 1. Tonight we have a special gift for a special group of lucky people. 
Tonight with my lesson, there's going to be a handout. Uh, just a reminder that we mentioned, I believe on Wednesday, perhaps even last Sunday. Tonight we're going to be studying from the book of Micah. And for those of you who regularly are in our Wednesday night class, if you would please bring your Micah booklet. And for those of you that are not a part of the Wednesday study, we'll have a handout for you so that you'll be able to keep up with the questions that we're going to be considering together tonight. Again, it's the book of Micah, and if you want to read ahead, it's going to be chapter 6 and perhaps a smidgen of chapter 7. Book of James. Have you ever anybody expressed the idea to you that, you know, the Bible is just not very practical? I mean, it's a lot of information. Maybe some's interesting, some is not, but in terms of Affecting a person's daily life, there's just not very much practical stuff in the Bible. Well, in fact, I would want to ask such a person who makes such a statement, who thinks like that, have you ever read the book of James? <laughs> this is practical Christianity. This is Christianity in action. Someone described the book of James as the gospel of common sense. It's everyday stuff, how we think, how we speak, how we treat other people. And today we're going to do what we sometimes do, and that is we're going to zero in on one verse. And that verse is verse 12. But before we get there, I don't know if your Bible has any headings or divisions, but if you were thinking about a division for verses 2 through 8, it might be trials and wisdom. How do those go together? And if you were thinking about verses 9 through 11, you might think in terms of the mindset of the wealthy and the poor. And then verses 13 to 15, if a man is tempted, let him not say that temptation comes from God. Well, sandwiched in between in that general context you've got the message of James 1 and verse 12. And so we're going to do what we often do when we label our lessons like this. We're just going to break down that verse. Not, not every individual word, but break down and, and look at some of the major components of that verse. And for those of you who have not yet uh, been able to read it, here's what that verse says. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, and we put in parentheses approved, that's the wording in the New King James. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that, what? Love him. And so that's the verse this morning. And so the first thought we want to look at is the idea of the first word in the verse. Now, you know, sometimes we talk about our blessings, we say, I'm so blessed, but actually this word here for blessed is a word that means happy. You might recall in the very opening portions of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the first words of the Master that are part of that great sermon are what we sometimes label as the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, verses 3 to 12, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are those that mourn, blessed are those that hunger and thirst, after, and so on. When it says blessed, it means happy. And so if you don't like being a happy person, this, this lesson this morning won't fit you well, okay? You know, I think there are some people, they've just decided, I'm not going to be happy. But this is a lesson about being happy. It's not the idea that we put our head in the sand and we close our eyes to things that are going on in life. But it's the recognition that if I am where I need to be spiritually, that if I'm in the right relationship with my God, even though there are going to be trials in life, even though there are going to be some troubles in life, I'm able to see the big picture and I can be a happy person. Now, along those lines, perhaps the wording of verse 2 in James 12 and James 1 is familiar. 
James 1 and verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when what happens? When all your problems are removed in life, be joyful. No, that's not what it said. It says count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, which means various trials. You say, well, how does that work? How is it that that trials or tests in life should cause me to be upbeat, optimistic, and glad I'm still alive? Well, there's a process there of growth. Verse 3 goes on to say, knowing what? That, That trials produce what? Patience. Somebody said, I just want to go straight to the patience and skip the trials. That's not how it works. Somebody said, I want to go straight to the joy and skip the trials. That's not how it works. Trials produce growth and spiritual growth and growth produces joy. Well, in chapter 1 and verse 12, the first thought is whatever's said in the rest of this verse, it's a verse about being happy, which we all know is a choice. So, blessed is the man. And the word for man here is not a male, but a human being. So this happy person is a person who in his or her life has and deals with temptation. Now, the Greek word behind our word temptation can have two meanings which are not very similar. One of those meanings is the idea of going through a test. And one of those meanings is the temptation to commit sin. Well, let me read from a source, uh, Mr. Joseph Thayer, who takes Greek words and gives us English definition. And I'll just read three or four distinct things he says about the meaning of the Greek word. He says it can mean the trial of a person's fidelity or virtue. In other words, it's a test of a person's character. He said it can mean an enticement to sin, the dangling of the bait, as we often think of temptation. He said it can be an internal temptation to sin, or he said it could be adversity, affliction, or trouble. And so basically then, as I tried to say a moment ago, the word temptation, as was used in the Greek language, could be in reference to the enticement to sin, dangling the bait, trying to get us to do wrong, or it could mean a test of our character. Now, when you read on in verse 13, there's no doubt that when the Bible says, when when a man is tempted, don't let him say I'm tempted of God, because that's the temptation, that's the enticement to sin. But I think fitting in the better context of the, of, the, of the chapter, the idea of the temptation here would be the trials, okay? Now, are we tempted? Yes, we are. Was Jesus tempted? Yes, he was. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Do we have to deal with suppressing and removing inappropriate desires that come from within us? Yes, we do. The Bible says abstain from fleshly lust." which war against the soul, 1 Peter 2 and verse 11. But it seems that more fitting to the context, verse 12, is, is the testing or trials of life. Not that we're being singled out necessarily, but you know, it can just be tough in life to just look at what's going on in the world and, and say, you know what? The rate of inflation, it's, it's hard to stay happy when inflation is is going like it's going now. It's hard to be happy when you go and you have sticker shock at at the gas station. You say it's hard to be happy when there's corruption among political leaders, whether they associate with blue, red, purple, or whatever it is. It's hard to be happy. And things in my personal life, it's a challenge to maintain my joy when I'm going through the health issues I'm facing or when I'm going through the financial crisis that I'm facing, or when I'm going through a relationship crisis which I'm facing, or a job crisis, or a school crisis, or whatever it might be. Those are tests 
Those are trials in life that each of us have to face in various forms. There's no place on earth you can get out a globe or you can get out a map and, and circle and say, that's where I want to live because people who live there, they don't have any tests or trials. That is paradise on earth. There is no such place. Look at, since we're in James, look over in the book of 1 Peter, the next book over. <coughs> Again, this concept of our character being tested. And here, it's, it's specifically in the wording of Peter is the language of the test or trial of our faith. Look in your Bible there in 1 Peter 1 and verse number 6. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in a heaviness through manifold temptations or trials, that the trial or test of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Our faith will be tested. Our mentality will be tested. Our commitment will be tested. And the passage which we're studying in James chapter one pronounces a blessing for an individual who in happiness responds properly to the temptations and the trials of life. We know this. It may be that from time to time a person is thinking, I've, it's just too much. What I'm facing in my life is too much for one person to have to handle. Well, we remember this promise that comes from the God of heaven. Number one, there's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted or tempted and tested above that ye are able. God knows we have a breaking point. He'll not allow us to be tested beyond that breaking point. But it's not simply the person who has trials. It's the person who endures. And so the next phase of our study or the next stage of the verse is the idea of enduring. Not just having them, not just being able to categorize them and identify them and say, well, this, this type of test in my life, that's what this is, or this type of trial is different. It's not simply knowing they exist. It's not simply acknowledging them. It's not simply identifying them. It is enduring them. It is sticking with the Lord and our commitment to him despite the trial. Now, not everyone does that, okay? It's possible for one to begin the Christian race and then at some point along the way take themselves out of the race. That's true, right? That, that the Bible compares the life of a Christian to a race. In Hebrews 11, you've got this long list of Old Testament characters who demonstrated a pattern of faith in their lives. And then flowing out of Hebrews 11 right into chapter 12, the opening words of Hebrews 12 are these words of exhortation for every Christian. Seeing then that we are compassed or about or surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, which would be those characters from chapter 11. Let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. We encourage people to obey the gospel. We encourage them to become a part of the race. But it's not just the starters who receive the crown of life. Those who are going to receive the crown of life are the endurers, the perseverers, the staying with it-ers. But not everyone does that. Hold your place here. Look over in Mark chapter 4. Jesus told a number of stories, and of the stories that he told, some were parables. And one of those parables, the parable of the sower, actually is recorded in three different books of the Bible. You can find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
But the, the, the thing that I, I think a lot of us really enjoy about the parable of the sower is, not only did Jesus tell it, he also explained it. And he didn't do that very often. Most of his parables were spoken, and then it's left up to the listeners and left up to you and me to figure out what it means. But in his explanation of the parable of the sower, he talks about there are different types of soil and the soil represents the heart of a person. Well, look in your Bible now in chapter 4, verse 16. Verse 16, I'll read 16, 17. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure, but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended and they drop out of the race. So they receive the word and then as things happen in life, when, when the trials and tests of life come along, they endure for a period of time and then they are gone. And so simply because the Lord calls on us to endure, that doesn't mean there's going to be 100% of his followers who endure to the end. Even when Jesus was living on the earth, there were some of his disciples who decided they weren't going to follow him anymore. What about Job? Today as we think about trials and tests, could Job feel what that was like? Man. Could he ever? Lost all, he had thousands, he had a livestock. Lost them all in one day. Had 10 children. Lost them all the same day. Lost his health. And his friends, uh, they weren't very helpful. Job, he, he had a lot of issues to face. And they, he didn't bring it on himself. You know, some things in life are self-afflicted wounds. That, that wasn't the case with Job. But the thing about Job, as we're reading in this wonderful book of James, over in James chapter 5 and verse 11, the Bible says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. You know what that goes with? You know what James 5 and verse 11 goes with? It goes right along with James 1 and verse 12. It says, We count them happy which endure. Well, could you give us a for instance? Yeah. You have heard of the patience or the perseverance of Job. So, so it's two separate sentences, but it's one idea. Happy are the people who endure. For instance, Job endured. Now, here's a question we could ask ourselves. Are you and I capable of enduring like Job did? Job endured through his time of trial and temptation. Are you and I capable of that? Sure we are. The Apostle Paul, as we think about first century followers of the Christ, the Apostle Paul faced trials and, and, and troubles and persecution that seemed to have exceeded the, the trials and, and the temptation and the troubles that, that others did at that time. Did Paul endure? Yes, he did. Is it possible for you and me to be imitators of Paul and endure? And, and the answer is yes. And so the blessing here that's pronounced in James chapter 1 and verse 12 is not simply for the person that breathes. It's not simply for the person who has trials. It's for the person who endures those things. Because what's going to happen? At the end of the line... This person's going to receive something, and, and the Bible calls it the crown of life. Crown was a symbol of victory. We, in modern times, are accustomed to thinking about the Olympics of our time or, or similar events, and you got a first place, second place, third place. And you got a gold medal, Start to say gold ribbon, I don't think so. Gold medal, silver medal, and a bronze medal. Or you got a blue, blue ribbon, a red ribbon, or whatever. Well, in ancient times, in the ancient races, 
you didn't, you didn't run or participate for first, second, or third. You went for first. Because the victor, the, the, the winner, and the winner alone was given a crown. And the crown was not made out of metal. We're not talking about the crown of a king, a different type of crown that was made by putting like, well, let me just say different types of vegetation in there. And it may have been so pretty when you first got it. But in the passing of time, of course, what's going to happen? It's, it's going to become not so pretty. But, but that, it's the word here. There's a crown that's promised to some individual. It's a symbol of victory. It's like in the book of Revelation chapter 2, when Jesus said to him that overcomes, he said, I'm going to allow him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, Revelation 2 and verse 7. Well, that tree of life in the paradise of God is a symbol of what? Eternal life. Just like the crown of life is a symbol of eternal life. Now, there's another Bible statement that may have a more familiar ring to a lot of us that also uses the language, the crown of life. It's Revelation, what, 2 and verse 10. And we're really familiar with the last part of that verse. And I will give thee a crown of life, right? Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. But, but, but before we get to the last part of the verse, there's got to be an opening and another part of the verse, right? And when you read that verse, it's a message from Jesus to the church in Smyrna. I'm saying Smyrna with a, a question. That's right, Smyrna, church in Smyrna. So, so Jesus said, and I'm, I'm going to pick out a few words, and I'm going to highlight those words. Before he ever gets to that crown of life, he said, here's what I see on your horizon." He said, here's what's coming up on your calendar. Here's what's going to happen in your lives. You're going to be tested. You're going to have trouble, tribulation. Some of you are going to prison. Trouble, tribulation, prison. And then he said, be thou faithful full unto death and I'll give thee a crown of life. Now, now the teaching of the New Testament is God wants us to be faithful until we leave this world. But it would seem in Revelation 2 and 10 the appeal is not necessarily to be faithful as long as you're alive but as you have trouble, tribulation, prison, even if you die for me, even if you lose your life because you're serving me, he said, you be faithful. And so in the new covenant, that crown is described as the crown of life. The Bible in other places speaks about receiving a crown as a symbol of victory. Uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, as Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, he made a reference to the ancient games, the, the sporting competition. It's chapter 9 and verse 25 of 1 Corinthians. And every man that striveth for the mastery in athletics is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. An earthly runner or pentathlon or decathlon participant, they do it to receive a corruptible or perishable crown. But we, an incorruptible, we're in pursuit of an incorruptible or an, a non-perishing crown. Okay? Another passage in which Paul speaks about that crown where he talks about, I've kept the faith, I've, I've finished my course, finished my race. He said, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord has promised to me, but not only me, but all those who love his appearing. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. Well, why would the crown be called a crown of righteousness? It doesn't mean the crown is made out of righteousness. I'm not talking about the materials of the crown, it's a spiritual environment, so it's not material but it's a crown of righteousness. It's a crown, it's a reward for being righteous. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, 
It's called the crown of glory. So it's called the crown of life. It's called an incorruptible or imperishable crown. It's called the crown of glory. And it's called the uh, crown of righteousness. It's a symbol of reward for those who are victorious. Now, who is it that promises this crown? The Lord does. And so one of the things we learn from that verse is the Lord is a promise maker. And in describing those crowns, or, or in describing those promises rather, Peter said they're great and they're precious. Now, when God makes a promise, does he have the ability, does he have the power to keep his promises? Well, sure he does. Hold your place and look with me over in Romans 4. Abraham is one Bible character who certainly was familiar with the idea of God making promises. There were several promises God made to Abraham. In Romans chapter 4, we read about Abraham's response to God's promises. Let's start in verse number 19. And I'm going to read through verse 21. Verse 19. And be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith or strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised he, God, was able also to perform. Abraham knew this. If God makes a promise, God is capable, he's capable of keeping every single promise he makes. So as we think about James 1 and verse 12 and the Lord making this promise, number one, the Lord makes promises. He's a promise maker. Number two, the Lord is capable of keeping his promises. And then number three, here's the really good part. <laughs> He always keeps his promises. And so somebody's wondering out loud, well, just how much of a guarantee is there? Okay, how much of a guarantee is there that when God makes a promise, he's going to come through and do what he promised to do? 100% guarantee that every time God makes a promise, He's going to keep it. Now, that's one of the differences between humans and God, but God's always going to keep his promise. So when you and I read in James 1 and verse 12 this idea about being happy, it's real. And when we read in James 1 and verse 12 about there being temptations and trials in life, it's real. And when we read in James 1 and verse 12 about a blessing for one who endures, that, that endurance is possible. And when we read about the crown of life, it's real. And when we read about the Lord's promise, that promise is real, and you can take it to the bank. Now, here's the last portion of the verse on which we want to focus this morning. That promise is for whom? It's for them or for those who love him. We use that word love all the time. You may have already said that word today. You may have said that word already four or five times. We talk about the things that we love. This is for those who love him. You say, well, everybody loves God, don't they? Well, everybody seems to enjoy the blessings they receive from God, though they don't always give him credit. But not everyone loves God. I mean, Jesus said that. As Jesus was speaking to a group of individuals, he said, I know you don't have the love of God in you. John 5 and verse 42. You say, well, has loving God always been something that God has wanted from mankind, or is that something that's new under the new covenant? No, it's that way. Remember, God's message to the children of Israel was they were to love God with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their soul, and all their strength. Deuteronomy 6 in verse 5. And so the concept of loving God, that's not something new under the new covenant, but the expectation is there. Look with me, if you would, in your Bible in John 14. You say, Brother Roger, I don't need to turn there. I know exactly what verse you're going to. Maybe you do. 
Maybe you do. There are 31 verses in that chapter. Maybe you think you know which one I'm going to. Maybe I will. Folks, says, okay, how do I know if I love God? I mean, I feel good about God. I, I like God. I feel good about what God does for me, but how do I show that I love Him? Would it be okay for me to express that verbally or to write it down? Well, sure. Nothing wrong verbalizing that. But how do I show it? Well, let's listen to what Jesus said. I want to start in verse 23. Raise your hand if you were thinking I was going to go to verse 23. Okay, got a lot of honest people today. I like that. All right, here we go. Verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love, again, a human, if a man love me, he will what? He will keep my words. In other words, if you wanted to just break that down and say, Jesus lovers, Jesus lovers, those who love Jesus, what do they do? They keep his words. Let's read on. And my Father will love him, and we'll come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sins. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. And so the words of Jesus are, someone, it's not simply talking about loving God, it's not simply claiming to love God, it's demonstrating it, and the proof is given by what? By keeping his saying, by doing what he said. You say, well, wouldn't a person need to do that with the right attitude? Absolutely. Well, wouldn't a person need to understand that, that we can't earn our salvation? Absolutely. But friend, there's no way around it. No human being pleases the God of heaven without submitting to what God says. Now the blessing pronounced in James 1 is God's going to give the crown of life to those that love him. Those who love him are those who submit to what he says. You say, well, don't you think we ought to treat our fellow man properly? That's part of doing what God says. There may have been some in the first century who had the idea, well, I'm going to love God, but I'm sure not going to love my fellow man. There's a bunch of stinkers out there. Well, what does the Bible say? How can we love God whom we've not seen if we don't love our brethren whom we have seen? 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. And so loving others, that's a wonderful thing, but that's part of loving God the God of heaven. Now I want to close with this thought. I should have put it on a screen, but I didn't. The reward promised in James 1 and verse 12 is what? The crown of life. And as you look at James 1 and verse 12, let's, let's think only for just a moment about James 1 and 12. According to James 1 and verse 12, what kind of person will receive the crown of of life. Well, I think there are two things that we could say in that regard. Number one, it's the person who endures, right? And it's the person who loves the Lord. So with that in mind, James 1 and verse 12, the blessing, crown of life. Condition, endure plus love the Lord. Let's think of another verse. As Jesus spoke about the resurrection from the dead, he said, some are going to be raised to the resurrection of condemnation, but some are going to be raised to the resurrection of life. Remember that? So let's just put that in the, in the category of the blessing that's promised, resurrection of life. Well, in that statement, what did Jesus say? Who are those who will be raised to the resurrection of life? Those who do good. John 5, 29, okay? So James 1, endure plus love God, crown of life. John 5, 29, do good, resurrection of life. And one final one, Matthew 25, 46, the righteous will receive eternal life. So here's your blessing, crown of life, resurrection of life, eternal life. Question, is that three different blessings or is that one blessing with three different descriptions? It's one blessing, right? If you have the crown of life, that's the resurrection of life and eternal life. But on this other side, you've got three different ways of saying what's expected. James 1, it's endure and love the Lord. John 5, it's do good. 
And in Matthew 25, 46, it's be righteous. Now, some individuals, and the reason I'm pointing that out is this reason. Some people like to latch on to John 5, 29, where Jesus said, those who do good will be raised into the resurrection of life. That's me. I've done a lot of good things in my life. I helped my Aunt Bessie clean out her chicken house. I helped that person the other day who was loading groceries into their car. I've done a lot of good things. Whoa, 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 whoa. Doing good involves doing kind deeds for others, but you see, doing good is the same as being righteous. It's the same as loving the Lord, which we show by what? Obeying what the Lord says. And so the crown of life is for those individuals. The great message of James 1 and verse 12. You, you could do that. You, you could take any verse of the Bible and give it the same title and just change the verse because every verse in the Bible is wonderful. But what about you this morning? Are you expecting, not demanding, but are you expecting to receive the crown of life? So well, I sure hope so. No, that's not good enough. In the Bible, the idea of hope is not simply I want it, it's expect it. Are you where you need to be spiritually? If you're a child of a living God, are you enduring through the trials of life with your eye focused on the crown of life and being with the Lord forever? If you're in need the prayers of the saints, we'll pray with you. If you're here and you've never obeyed the gospel, if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, ready to repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be immersed in water for the remission of sins. God's promise is, I'll wash away your sins, and I'll remember them no more. If you're subject to God's invitation, would you come as you stand with me? Oh, oh.
seated, please. We're going to sing uh, 432. After that, be led in our closing prayer. And then uh, Brother Larry Clark will have an announcement. So sing a song, have a prayer, listen to Larry. 432. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, oh, press on every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly foe, that Would you bow with me? Lord and Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Father, for the many blessings that we have, for this safe place to gather and pray and worship in your name, for our preachers and teachers who help minister the bread of life in your word, for our song leader who helps lift up our voices in praise. We are thankful, Father, for your son, for his sacrifice and for his re redemption and coming back to us to help. Please be with those, Father, that were sick or hurt who are mentioned here today. Please help heal them in a way that only you can, and bring them back to us, Father, so they may continue to worship. Please help be with us, Father, as we go to our classes. Help open our hearts and minds so we may continue to learn. And as the seasons grow dark, Father, help keep us safe and be the light that we need you to be and to continue to walk with us. It is in your Son's name we pray, Father. Amen. Brother Lewis and I are pleased to announce that Brother Rick Owens will assume the duties as the full-time preacher for the Grange Lake Road congregation, effective November the 20th. Brother Owens will also assume the duties as the director of the Chattanooga School of Preaching and Biblical Studies. We have grown in our love and appreciation for Brother Owens and his family as they have worshiped with us these past several months. We look forward to working with him in his new role in the coming days. Thank you, you're dismissed.
kind of crowded around here, Bob. If you want to, we get one of the ushers to try to find you a seat, okay? <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Boy. <laughs> uh. Uh, We're studying the subject of wives and husbands and the Lord's church and the likeness thereunto today. A great, great study in the New Testament, book of Ephesians, chapter 5. And, and uh, there, begin down around verse 22, and uh, so we invite you just to be a part of our class. We're going to begin with a prayer if you bow your heads. Our Father in Heaven, we are so grateful that you are indeed our Heavenly Father. And we're so thankful, Father, that we can come before your throne and make our requests and unto thee and give you our thanksgiving, which we do at this time for your many and your great and your wonderful blessings. And we ask your continued kindness and long-suffering with us as your people, as your children. Father, we have our complete dependence upon thee, and we are so thankful for your many blessings and care for us in so many ways. We pray again, Father, for the good people in the country of Ukraine, that you would remove this evil from their land, that they may live in their homes in peace. And pray for our brothers and sisters who live in that good land, that you'd watch over and bless them and strengthen them in a good way. And Especially mindful, Father, for Natasha's precious mother and for her brother and his family who are still in that country at this time, that you would watch over them. Bless Brother Sharenko and the brethren there, other brethren there in Kiev who are trying to carry on your work there, and Brother Boyko in the city of Cherkasy who's trying to carry on the work there still in a good way, and they're doing a great work at this time. Be with us today as we continue our study in your word and give us the wisdom and strength to do so in such a way to be uplifting and encouraging to us as your children here in this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Marriage goes back. How, when did marriage get started, by the way? Who started that, who started that sort of thing? The Lord God himself did it. And uh, when he created man on the sixth day, took him from the dust of the ground. That means we're just dirt folks, by the way. <laughs> And formed God out of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. A man became a living soul. And uh, so we are a creation of the Almighty God. And it says in verse 18 in chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, the one we just noted with chapter 2 and verse 7, that God looked and he saw his creation, looked around, and he said, it's some, Something wasn't good. Though. All the things that God created, and he said it's good, but he said, there's something that wasn't good. What is it that was not good that God said in chapter 2 and verse 18? That man should be alone. And so that wasn't good. Did the Lord God fix that? He fixed it. And he fixed it in the most wonderful way. And you stop and give thought to it if you will. He says, I will make him what? A help meet for him. The idea of a helpmate there is someone who is part and parcel of that individual, that man, if you will. And so the woman that he made, in fact, it says on down here, he caused a deep sleep, verse 21, to fall upon Adam. He slept. He took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof. And he took that rib which the Lord God had made from man, made he woman, brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, for she shall be called woman. Because she was taken out of man, therefore, verse 24, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And so there's the beginning. So God's process in his creation, the completion of it when he brought into existence the relationship of the husband and the wife as such, and that wonderful concept, if you will. So that was the beginning of the home. That was the beginning of this great and wonderful relationship in there. And from that day forward, Adam and Eve, they were one and one flesh because they were come from the same source, I guess is one way of putting it there, they will. And so he's going to, man leaves his father and mother. When he does that, he joins himself to his wife. And they, they enter into that great and wonderful uh, relationship which we call marriage which our world in which we live has basically disgraced in so many ways, but yet there are those who still uphold God's standard. 
that's what our concern is in our life as Christians as such, doing what he will. Our Lord Jesus Christ was questioned by the Pharisees, the record being Matthew chapter 19 there, whether well, it's lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause. I think it's significant that they said his wife for every cause. And Jesus made a reference there to what did he refer to these Pharisees? What event? one we've just been noticing back in Genesis chapter 2, isn't it? And so he says, have you not read, which means that there was a written record of those matters, and we just made note of that written record from Genesis chapter 2. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them what? Male and female. Who did the making? God did. And when he made them, he made the man, and then he made the woman, if you will, and he says, there are no more twain, our Lord says there. He said, well, he said in verse 5, this call shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. But here's the relationship that was established by God in the beginning. By the way, did the Lord Jesus Christ believe that the Genesis record in chapters 1 and 2 were actual, factual, and true records? He did, did he? And he made reference on them as such. And so when Jesus says these were actual, factual, and true records, and I think we can, if we do believe in Jesus, which we, of course, do as Christians, then we can count those records as being inspired. And so when God created the heavens and the earth in six days, six literal 24-hour days, you can fellow says you can mark it down as that which is, took place as the Lord said it took place. And, so, and just in case there's any question about it, the Lord said this in verse 6 of chapter, book of ch uh, chapter 19 of Matthew. He says, Wherefore there are no more twain but one flesh, and what therefore somebody put together, who did that? What therefore God, God hath joined together, but what's man going to do about that? Gonna leave it alone. Let not man put asunder. And those are not just words of suggestion. They're not just words of, uh, so you know, here's a good idea. Here is a divine structure of the home, the relationship, which we call marriage, where the man and the woman are joined together, joined together by the Lord God himself. So when two people come together to be married, in whatever form the ceremony may take, depending on what part of the world they're in, what age they're in, I guess, and such, there's a third party that's also present in that union. Who is that? That's God. And so when that joining together on that occasion is not just something that man has devised or designed, but it's that which God himself has ordained. And so we are thankful, you know, our young, you know, our young people are put, they make the most important decisions of their life when they're young. Isn't that isn't it interesting? You know, if man worked that thing out, we would probably say, well, you know, there's not any greater decisions than perhaps a decision to become a child of God and probably, probably pretty close to the same interest or level would be choosing whom I'm going to become married to and spend the rest of my life with. And those are decisions, choices which are made by our young people at a young time in their life. Man, man would probably come on and say, you know, we ought to wait at least 30, 40 years before we make those decisions. It doesn't work that way, does it, Kate? It just doesn't work that way. And so here are great decisions. So it's so important that we need to know and understand and teach and preach what God says about these basic fundamental things in the process there. So our text in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, describes the roles of the wives and the husbands and the relationship, the marriage relationship, and it makes an analogy between this relationship to Jesus Christ and His church. And uh, so, uh, husbands are to love their wives in a particular way. Wives are to have a particular relationship to their husbands. And the Lord's church is that which is used as an analogy to demonstrate these great things. So let's look at verse 22 and begin to think about these things a little bit more full, if you will. And. Uh, Paul has been writing to the Christians there that were walking light, he says back in verse 8. And then in verse 22, he simply says this in Ephesians chapter 5, speaking first to the wives in verses 22 through 24. He said, uh, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 
Therefore, verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the lives be to their own husbands in everything. And here's a great and wonderful instruction that God has given between, you know, wives have a particular role in the marriage relationship. The husbands have a particular role in the marriage relationship. Children in that home, they have a particular role in which they also are responsible for. And the one who sets the standard and designs the design that role is, the, is of a divine nature. He is God. And so when he says, wives, submit yourselves unto whose husband? Their own husband, which means they have one. That's all they need. They're all allowed to have if they're going to be in God's will and do it as God would say to do it. So. And uh, so, and then he puts some qualifying. There's a great, old, big, huge word in verse 22. It has two letters in it. Guess which word that is? As, A-S. And so the subjection that the wife is to be unto her husband, her own husband, is as or like unto that which what is what? As unto whom? And so this relationship is that which is established by the authority of the Lord Himself. And this is not a negative relationship. It's not an oppressive relationship. It is actually, it is actually the fulfillment of the complement of one, one entity as such. Remember back in Genesis 2 and verse 18, God said, I will make a what for him? A help meet for him. Which means without her, he is what? He really not complete to firm the function which God would have him to do as such. And so, Brother Bob. Force? That word is, yeah, that is not in there, is it? No, but it just seems like the home is not a weapon, you know, to, to the women to submit their husbands. Yeah. Not, there's nothing that the husband is supposed to do to make his wife submit to her. Yeah. Am I off base on that? But I've been around guys that think, you know, the Bible says I've got to make sure I do what I say. In other words, she's under divine command of whatever our order she's got to do. That's, I've heard I've heard that. Yeah. I think exact number one, the instruction is to the wife, you do the submitting, right? So the wife is the one who chooses. And number two, the analogy that God is going to make is between this relationship and the Lord's church. So we are his we are the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Are we to submit unto Him? We are. Why do we do that? Did somebody say you have no alternative but to do so? Nobody said that, did they? We can choose to do so or not to do so, and so we do so because we choose to do so. We desire to do so. We understand God's will, and therefore we do it as the Lord instructs us. That's the idea. And the idea of the oppressive concept that you speak of, Brother Bob, is good to talk about, I think. It's just about as far from the Scripture as anything you can do. And uh, when we get through with our discussion here, if everything goes hopefully as we think it might, and the idea is going to be that the relationship that the husband and wife have is a mutual relationship one with another. Because after all, there are societies in the world in which we live where marriages are prearranged. And uh, either the woman doesn't have the choice as to whom she's going to marry. Sometimes a man doesn't have. They're prearranged. Of course, that's what. But generally, as we have to do with it, and I think it from a biblical perspective, here is something where this woman and this man, they make the choice together that they're going to become one in marriage. That's, that's a choice that they make together. And when they enter into it, they enter into the confines of the nature of that relationship. And indeed, it is the most wonderful and functional relationship that could possibly be in the process. And the woman's role in the marriage is such important. In fact, without that role, you're not going to have a marriage. Without her role, you're not going to have a home. Without her role, the children are not going to be brought up in a way in which God would have them be brought up. And the, uh, without her role, the husband's going to be, you know, probably about as miserable as anybody could be. And uh, process. But when you put it all together, as God has designed us such a beautiful and functional relationship, if you will. So the her submissive concept 
is one in which she enters into by virtue of the fact that she looks at it not just from a man's perspective, but here's what the Lord's will is for me to do, as unto the Lord. And so we do, we act, we live as if we are kind of like the Lord we talked about, and we'll talk about in our lesson next week about the you know, they are in obedience to their masters because they are in unto the Lord as such. And so the husband and wife relationship is not a master and a lesser person relationship. It is a relationship between two people that God, the Lord God Himself, has joined together to function in a particular predesigned divine manner which He has set forth in His will. And it is a fact, as stated in verse 5, that uh, there is a headship, the husband's head, and it's also even as who? There's that word as again. As Christ is what? The head of the church. So the relationship where you have the husband and wife, if the husband is not going to function as the head, if you will, as such, then that relationship is not going to be as God would have it to be, and it's not going to provide what God intended for it to provide. And Christ is head of the church. The church is in submission to the Christ as such. And of course the head then has some responsibilities which are specifically and unique, uniquely His, if you will. And uh, it says in the latter part of verse uh, 23 that He is also what? The Savior of the body, isn't it? The body being the church in there. So those great things. And so there's a therefore in verse 24, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And those of you who have enjoyed the joys of, of marriage, or maybe one or two or three or four or more years or what have you, you understand that when the husband functions as a husband's supposed to function, if you will, it's really not any great problem for the wife. In fact, she's encouraged and enhanced to function as she God has designed for her to function. And put them together, they make a pretty strong entity, don't they? But you start messing around with the design that God gives, and you're going to end up with trouble and problem. It's such. So there you go. And uh, if, if I am a wife, and if my husband is loving me like Christ loved the church, am I going to have any problem with that? I don't have any problem with that, are we? In fact, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. And if my if I am a wife and my husband is functioning, what does that mean then that the wife has no input or influence uh, relative to the affairs of the marriage or to the running of the home as such? Is that what that means? Some people think so, don't they, Bob? I don't believe it. You think? Can, uh, can you imagine... Can you imagine, I can imagine, can you imagine what the home would be like if the wife was not fulfilling her role as, as a wife? That fellow in there just called the husband, boy, he's in a mess for sure now, isn't he? <laughs> they said, nothing is functioning going as it ought to be. And so they worked together, hand in hand, heart in heart, faith in faith, as such, to carry out God's will and the love that they have and the love that they come together to know is that which is likened to the love that Jesus Christ has for His church. What kind of love, what kind of love did Jesus have for His church? He gave Himself. It's a sacrificial love, isn't it? Sacrificial. And when we say to our mates, I love you, whether it be the husband or the wife or the wife to the husband, those words are words which simply are verbalizing a life or a commitment or a relationship which is holy, H-O-L-Y, and also W-H-O-L-Y, or the two L's only, and I forgot, but completely that which God would have it to be. And it has sometimes say designed that we might call a little bit of heaven on earth as such because it provides that great and wonderful relationship as such. And so wives are simply, you know, here's the kind of order of God thing. God has put those plain things in order, and He's given responsibilities to those things. Back in 1 Corinthians 11 and 3, it talks about this same order, if you will. It says the husband is the head of the wife, and uh, there, and uh, uh, who is the head of the man? Christ. 
And who's the head of Christ? God, Paul. One is not dependent on the other. She's still what? She's still, she's still commanded to submit. Okay. I'm asking you that. Like that well, that's... Yeah. If, uh, yeah. if a man is loving his wife like the church... Yeah. What if... Here's years of what if, you know. What if the husband... That's just for scenario, for example. The husband makes demands of his wife. You're not going over there to worship on Lord's Day morning. Is a wife in, is a wife to be in subjection of that authority? Who comes first, the Lord's commands or man's commands? The Lord. I think the point is, and could be demonstrated without a great deal of difficulty, if if it's so unfortunate that the wife is the, being abused, or if the husband is abusive as such, and making demands and things which are absolutely in, out of harmony with God's will or God's treatment of her, then the question is, is she, under, is she under divine obligation to obey that which is going to be out of harmony with God's will? And the answer is, no. Uh, it's an interesting thing. Down through the years, I've had opportunity in dealing with people a few times as such, and sometimes, uh, occasionally, not many times, thankfully, occasionally I found situations where you have a relationship there and the wife is actually being abused. I mean physically as well as mentally by that man. And I could, I've always told him, I said, listen, you don't have to take that. You know, God doesn't command or demand you to do that. And I said, you have recourses to that. And one of the recourses that I suggested, you may disagree with me on that, but that's all right. One of the recourses I said, you know, we live under the law of the land, and this fellow's breaking the law of the land. <laughs> and so that wife can make appeal to the authorities of the land, can't you, brother? Just to make the authority of the land. You know, the, the, the lady, you know, one who is, who unfortunately, and this does happen, but thankfully not as much perhaps as we might think, unfortunately finds herself in the circumstances of where she is not being treated in a godly, that is a God-ordained manner as such. And she is nobody, dear folks, nobody is under command anytime, anywhere, whatever situations, to act in, out of harmony with God's will. God's will. And so I've known the circumstances where there's been uh, great pressure put upon uh, an um by an unbeliever who may to one who wants to become a Christian and try to deter that, or one who is a Christian and try to interfere with them serving and being a faithful Christian. And it's a terrible thing to have to deal with. That's a, and so the wife in that situation, she would go ahead and she says, well, this is what the Lord's will is. Someone says she might take a beating for it, and she may. She really, really, really might take a physical beating for that. And, but she should go ahead and do it anyway. And, that, and then when people ask, you know, what are all those bruises you all over you for? I say, well, my husband beat me up because I wanted to come be a Christian. You think that sort of might bring an end to that sort of thing? I do. I do. Yeah. Anything. It, it's a brother or a brother. Yeah. Just, just a moment. It's not. Yeah. Donna makes an excellent point. You know, because someone's abused, that's, that's not grounds for divorce. There's only one grounds for that. That doesn't change as such. It just simply means here's a, here's a terrible situation needs to have some needs to be addressed as such. Sometimes, and along that particular line, sometimes we find a situation of where a wife is unjustly, for whatever way we'll say, put away. It's a, well, bottom line is she's still married to that individual, and she still has certain responsibilities toward 
that individual. And uh, so that, that doesn't give her free reign to go out in the world and do anything else else. But abuse is not grounds for divorce. There's only one reason for divorce. One. One, 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 one. And that's it. Brother Bob. Psychological suffering sometimes can be greater than the physical suffering, can you? It surely can, okay. But anyway, here's the one of one thing. God has given us such a beautiful design for such a beautiful and wonderful and functional and, and a profitable relationship between the husband and the wife. And fellas, you can't, in fact, the, the, the relationship that Christ has with the church is, that, is the analogy of that, if you will. Let's go on and talk about a little bit more. Let's talk about that husband. And uh, a little bit on him, beginning about verse 25, I think it is. And the husbands, what are they to do? Love your wives. Is that a suggestion? More than a suggestion, isn't it? That's a command of God. Love your wives. Well, what does it mean to love your wife? Hmm. Uh, huh? Examples how Christ loved the church, isn't it? It's a sacrificial love. It's a love, you know, the concept of love is that which always, without exception, always seeks the very best, the best, the good for its object. So if I say I love my wife, whatever action I take toward her is, is it should be designed and intended for her good and for her best. Does that mean that I'm always perfect in my assessment? No, because I'm human, you know, just like anybody else. But that has to be my fundamental purpose and design, you know. If it's not good for her, it's not good for me. It's because I'm to love her as I love myself. We'll find on down the text here in the process. And so that's that. And so it's a, a, a commandment. It, God, God has given the husband some certain responsibilities. Much of our, or many of our problems in our uh, relationships today is because the husband refuses to accept the responsibility that God has given him and to and to exercise, to exercise that responsibility in an effective way. And so he has those responsibilities. Commitment, he has to have that commitment. Love has to be there if you process. And we're to love our wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I think I've probably used this illustration before, but back several years ago, a beautiful couple had two young boys, and they were just such, such lovely kids. Just good kids, if you will. He's still young in there. And he and his process and his work there had some relationships. He didn't get involved immorally with this person, but to uh, the, on a friendship basis that was creating some problems. Well, if I'm a husband and if I'm on the job, what have you, and if I'm uh, getting into a friendship basis with one of the uh, opposite sex there, and if that's creating a problem with my wife, what do I need to do? I need to change my direction. Why? Just simply because I love my wife and care for her and I don't want her to be unduly stressed because those things, if you will. Anyway, this young man, whose father, by the way, was an elder in the Lord's church, and he was such a great servant in the church at that time, both him and his wife, he decided that the best thing for them to do was that they would just get a divorce. No, no scriptural grounds for it, that they would just get a divorce and he would continue providing the financial support for her and for the boys, if you will. And they would all, they would both just keep on continuing coming to services and worshiping and that sort of thing, if you will. Well, you don't have any trouble seeing through that, I'm sure. But anyhow, we finally got him to come in and sit down, and we had, had a discussion with it. And uh, we went back, if I recall correctly, basically to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. And we pointed out things such, you know, love your wives as Christ like and I said, you know, is that a suggestion or is that a command? He said, well, he said, God commanded that, if you will. 
you are to be the head. You are to provide the leadership in your home. Is that, is that what you're proposing to? He said, well, you know, you know, Brother Jimmy said, I don't guess I just ever did think about it in that way. Didn't think about it in that way. At that time, Fred and I were making trips to Ukraine once a year over there to work, try to help a little bit in that work. And so we were there in the city of Kiev, and we got a telephone call one day from this good brother. He said, I just wanted to call you all the way from America to let you know. He said, things are all right now. He said, I thought about what you said. He said, we're back together, and the family is as it ought to be. It wasn't a problem of the immorality, it was just a problem of the fact that here was a man who was not fulfilling his God-given responsibility as being the head of the house and taking care of matters like he knew. And to be the head of the house doesn't mean that he is a dominant uh, authority to control and determine that everything that's going to be done. He don't determine what's going to be fixed for the meals. He don't determine what's going to be used for the washing process. He doesn't determine everything that needs to be done relative to the care of the kids. You know, that, that's, a, that's a help meets pro, pro, process in there. But sometimes we just get all out of kilter and upset and we get going in the wrong direction. And we just need to be brought back this basic fundamental thing that this is not just a thought or a good thing to do. This is a God-given standard which we are to abide by. And so uh, uh, I've noticed a few times down through the year, young ladies especially, you know, seemed like that they were been a little bit uh, not too in, too eager to enter into a marriage relationship. And when you talk to a man, he says, well, I just haven't found anybody yet that would that I want to be married to. And so that means these good old boys need to get their act back together and be what God would have them to be. Then they'll be worthy su subjects for, for marriage. And so, so husbands have a tremendous responsibility. And when they fail to exercise and carry out that responsibility, it's going to impact not only the wife, it's going to impact the children, it's going to impact their service in the Lord's kingdom and everything that you would. Jesus' love was a sacrificial love, and uh, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I believe I read that somewhere. Where what? Maybe, maybe it's in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Even as Christ gave himself for it. So you take a fellow who is a husband whose biggest objective in life as far as their relationship, marriage relationship is, is to give himself for her. How about that? And uh, who, who does that put up as number one? That puts her up there as number one. That's where she belongs. That's where God put her. So in his eyes and his side and his relationship, and that, that's, that's, that's number one as such. And uh, so like Christ loved the church, he gave himself for it. And here's the results of it, verses 26 and 7. And it shows, I think, the impact of this good relationship. It might sanctify and cleanse it. What does it mean to sanctify something? Set it apart, doesn't it? Right? So here is that number one which is holy. And uh, that, and in fact, it's still said it's supposed to be holy and without blemish. Latter part of verse twenty-seven, sanctify and wash it, and and Christ, in the process of our sanctification, coming into the Lord's church, sanctify it and wash it. What's the washing by the word has to do there? How how does that taking place? By or when we are baptized into Christ, and uh, did the church ever call the bride of Christ? It is it. And, you know, John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. And uh, so, very beautiful, beautiful concept there, beautiful thing. And so, here is a relationship that's going to be one which is set apart. It is that particular relationship which is maintained between one man and one woman, not any man and man or woman and woman concept, one man and one woman. And that relationship is to be in effect until the death of the one of those mates. And uh, the only exceptions is very horrible because it's brought about by a unfaithful uh, act on the part of one of those mates. And that's just, that's, that's just so terrible, if you will, in the process. 
but it should be holy without blemish. How are you going to go about blemishing up this relationship with, uh, between the man and the wife, husband and wife? How are you going to go about blemishing that thing up? Do what? Don't get say to be to your own husband. Let that be it, right? Yeah. So, don't become over friendly with the other other sex. That doesn't mean we can't be friendly, respect. We, you know, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we have a great love for each other, and respect for each other, and we honor each other. But uh, when it comes to our relationship with our mate, then that fellow says that's it. Nobody messes with that. Just don't let anybody mess around with that. It's just out of place to do so. Just don't mess around with it, if you will. And so we to be sanctified, set apart that which is holy, that which is from God, as God would have it to be in the process there. Be holy without blemish. Our Lord, uh, what was the Lord willing to do for the church? He was willing to do what? To die, didn't he? Jesus died for it. And so if I love my wife, like the Lord says I'm expected to love my wife, that means here is one person that I would die for. I really don't know many marriages where that hadn't been the case as such, where you have God-ordained marriages and you'll have a husband who would die for his wife, he would die for his children. And I'm not talking about just in a metaphorical way, I'm talking about a literal concept, if you will. Because those things are the highest, precious, most valuable relationship. Because it's a God or just like the church is God ordained. Who set forth the standards and the regulations for the Lord's church? Well, to ask the question, say the Lord's church, that tells what the answer is, doesn't it? The Lord did. Who set forth the standards and the regulations for the marriage relationship? The Lord did. Same standard of authority, if you will. And when those two come together, God's admonition them, I said earlier, He said, man is not to mess with. Let not man put us under. It's just, just some, someone says, well, the law in our land says this. So what? The law in somebody else's land is going to say something different, most likely. So how many laws does God have relative to that particular aspect? It's what? Well, someone says, well, you go from this country to that country, you have different laws and different regulations. And if we're going to use that standard made by man relative to these regulations, then we have just made the law of God a subjective law. You know what that means? That means that man is writing the law on the books, and it's subject to his whims and his wits, a will or so. It doesn't come from God. The objective law of God, which means the standard which God supplies, is the same in every land, in every country, at every time. Hadn't changed. And someone, yes, sir, Mr. Rock. So can what? The laws of the land can change, doesn't it? And Sometimes we've tried to encourage people to stop and think, you know, relative, relative to this idea of divorce and remarriage and so forth. And they say, well, here's, here's the state of Tennessee. They, here's, here's the law in the state of Tennessee relative to divorce. And you go down a few, a few, a few miles south of us, and what do they call it when you divorce without any response? You don't have any reason. What do they, what do they call it? I forgot. Huh? No fault. No thank you. No fault as such. And you get a divorce down there, but you go to another state and you got. In order to have a divorce, you've got to have some specific reason. So I go down to the no-fault state, and I get a divorce. 
Then I move over here to this other state which has particular reasons and I haven't met those reasons. So, what is my divorce now? My divorce now no longer valid because I live under a different law? Wasn't valid to start with, was it? It won't be valid under that one. And so like Peter says, we ought to obey who rather than men? Obey God. And so we make laws and we're thankful for our Constitution, don't misunderstand. And we're even thankful that we have the right, or the right to go back and make the adjustments above it. But when a law says it's all right to kill a child before it's born, does that make it all right? It doesn't make it all right, does it? If the law says you can just, if you don't like your mate, if you, know, if you don't cook like you want her to cook, just get rid of her, or if he's not doing like she thinks he can get, she can get rid of her, that, uh, that, that's not God's way. Simply not God's way. Anyway, and think about it. And so let's look just very brief at another point or two before we come to an end here. It said, Men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. In verse 28, He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Well, every man likes to love himself, I guess. <laughs> and the key to loving ourselves is to love our wives. What about somebody who doesn't love their wives? Well, they don't love themselves, do they? Why is that the case? They're one, aren't they, Brother Reggie? They come together and they're one as such. And so that's kind of like saying, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like this side of it, but this other side over here, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Well, no, it's a unity. It's a unit. It goes together, if you will. And uh, so love your wives, you love yourself. And look, verse 29, I like, and it's, a, I think, a key thought here. No man ever hated his own flesh. It's not the nature of man, you know, to hate himself. Now, some people do. I know some people get into the state and they have some psychological problems and they, you know, they need help. But that's not man's nature as such. But uh, he, what does he do? What do we need normally do? We try to nourish, nourish it and cherish it even as the Lord the church. There's that word as again. And the Lord nourishes and cherishes. It means he holds it in great value. He does everything he can to provide it strength and to build it up and to make it what it ought to be. And that's what man ought to be doing as such. Not to destroy, tear down, or demine, demean, but to make it the most holy thing that he possibly could, if he will. And so to nourish it and ensure it as the Lord, we're members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. And he says on down in 31, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, be joined to his wife. They too shall be one flesh. And he makes his idea, he says, this is a great mystery, that I'm, but what's he talking about there, he said? Verse 32. Speaking concerning what? Christ. Church. So, in my main subject, that, but he's using Christ and the church as the analogy for the relationship of the marriage union between the husband and the wife, if you will. Beautiful thought. And so 30, 33 ends up that every one of you in particular so love his wife as whom? Mm -hmm. Himself. Now we'd love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And we're to love our wives as himself too. Don't hate it, Brother Ed. And it, you know, it's a very special, you know, really a divine concept of love, if you will. Now, you know, I have many sisters in Christ, and I love them all, don't we? Yeah. But I have a wife, and I love her uniquely, I guess would be one way to put it, you know, like no one else. And not only a sister in Christ, but uh, as, you know, that, that just kind of like loving myself, because, you know, without... When there's a, when that union is broken there, then that, that's a that's a traumatic event in the process. Well, let's look at our questions very quickly here. Uh, how should wives submit submit to their husbands? Twenty-two. Ask to the Lord. 
What does Paul say Jesus is in verse 23? He's what? Head of the He's the head of the church. And what relationship does he have to the body also? He's the savior of the body, isn't he? So he's the head of the church. Number three, how are husbands to love their wives? Verse 25. Like Christ loved the church. Boy, that's, that's, you know, those, those are words easy to say, but the depth of meaning and the application of them is so profound. Why did Jesus give himself for the church, 26 and 7? Yeah, clean and holy, sanctify, clean and holy, without spot or blemish. And that's the wonderful relationship, but in the marriage relationship, you know, you have two people come together, they live their lives together as one, and that relationship is clean, it's holy, it's without blemish, without spot. Now, you can't find many things like that in the world in which we live, but that marriage relationship, and it's, when it's done God's way, is just exactly that and that. So it makes it a very special thing. What does Jesus do for the church? What in verse 29? He nourishes it, share it to cherish something means it was just really thing. And then finally, what two words does Paul use to summarize the actions of husbands and wives in verse 33? Okay, love and reverence. Reverence, that is to have reverence. Uh, see that she reverence her husband. That means she has respect for him as such. And he needs to earn, he needs to deserve that respect as such. Question, comment? Y'all are such a good group of folks. I just, I just like coming together with you. Go ahead. Brother, Brother Jerry. Say that again. Yeah. Also One sin that can't be forgiven. And what is that, Brother Jerry? Blaspheming the Holy Ghost or a sin for which man will not repent. Okay. A blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Which is? Well, from First John. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the, the idea, the, uh, when you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, that means you're speaking, you, you have taken a stand of, of great bitterness and vile, vile opposition to the things of the Spirit of God. And you know, huh? Yeah, okay, that's it. Let's pray, brother. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing upon us. Thank you for the blessed, good strength that you provide for us. And thank you, dear God, for our homes, for the precious union of husband and wife, and for the children that you grant and bring. That allow us to be a part of in this world for us also having been children, Father, and being blessed by those who loved us and cared for us and want us to do well in this earth. Be with us and use us to your glory is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.